Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. Five days ago, David Wallace Wells published this, had this article published in the New York Times Magazine, The Uninhabitable Earth. Okay, hit a nerve with the public, with mainstream media, with uh, mainstream scientists, with lots of people. Lots written about it um, since the article came out. People, number of people are saying that the article is too, um, it, it is too uh, ap apocalyptic, you know, it's worst case scenarios, things like that. I beg to differ. This is exactly where we're heading with our climate. And I will basically address the criticisms from the scientific community on, on this article. So let's get, get right into it. So if you just Google New York Magazine climate change and uh, just find the article, the original one, I think it's the first uh, link here. Okay, New York Magazine, just click on it and read the article. Now, there's been lots written and I'm not gonna go into all of these things that have been written, either saying, did it freak you out? Good, you know, it's a doom piece, case study of not how not to write a story. Uh, we're not alarmed enough about climate change. Is it too scary? Are we doomed as it says, etc., etc.? Okay, I'm not going to talk about those things now. What I'm going to focus on is what the scientific community is saying. So here we go. Climatefeedback.org is a great organize. It's a great website, a great organization. When an article comes out, either um, on climate change that's of importance, that gets lots of views, etc. This organization has a group of scientists, probably different ones, and they come on and they rate, they basically review the article and they give it a rating and then the overall rating is accumulated and their comments are accumulated. Okay, so let's see what they say in the case of this particular article. Okay, so here they say, they here, here's, what they, here's the, the website. Um, if, I, if you just click on that link, okay, so 16 scientists looked at the article, estimated its overall scientific credibility to be low, okay? They said it's alarmist, imprecise, unclear, misleading. These people, so scientists are just humans. They're also specialists. They're very, very specialized in narrow areas. So here they are talking about a paper, and it's very enlightening and interesting to see their comments and to see how out to lunch they are in their analysis. And their overall rating on this paper, on this article, is scientific credibility minus 0 0.7. You know, minus one is low, zero is neutral, two is very high, okay? So they're basically saying that this article is not, this is the sci overall scientific credibility. But it's amazing how they came up with these numbers. I'm gonna delve into the details and show that they're just, they're, they're, uh, they don't know what to do about the rapid changes that are happening. Of course, everything in the climate system is happening faster than expected. What's expected is from models, it's from mainstream science. So mainstream science doesn't have a good handle on abrupt climate change. And it's about time they come clean on that. And, and uh, we need to let the public, let the politicians, you know, we need to revamp the IPCC process because everything is, is changing so fast getting so far out of hand, we have a climate change emergency. So th they jumped all, all over this paper here. And, uh, you know, so let's jump on them. Let's, uh, you know, let's see what's going on. So here's what the summary was. Um, this article talks about potential impacts of climate change if no action's taken. Now, I d it says it explores worst case scenarios. This is not correct, okay? The IPCC um, AR4 said that the planet would rise from two to four and a half degrees, okay, was the um, sensitivity with a doubling of CO2, um, uh, CO2 equivalent. And then that was changed to 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius. A very recent paper says that sensitivity is more like even seven, six and a half or seven degrees. Um, and also will we'll exceed uh, doubling of uh, CO2 for that type of sensitivity, you know, very, very much sooner because the rises of, of levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are, are hitting record levels. So 
it's not a worst case scenario. This is a scenario of where we're heading right now, business as usual, usual in a very short number of years. It's not nothing like a worst case scenario. Um, you know, worst case scenario would be climate change takes out every human on the planet, every every living thing on the planet. Wouldn't that be something like worst case? This is a very this is a very non scientific term. So you know, it's amazing that it's coming from the so-called mainstream scientists. So scientists reviewed the article and they said to see whether the scenarios reflect the state of knowledge. And there's been a lot of stuff coming on, so they say it's a complex article, it misrepresents research, other, some other, and, and some others are saying that it lacks the context to be understood by the reader. You know what, readers have access to Google, they read something and don't understand it, they can Google it. You know, it's about time to stop protecting the readers, thinking that they can't handle uh, the truth. They can't handle information that is really bad because it's going to harm the addressing climate change if everybody's scared. Well, sorry, but we lived under, under the shadow of nuclear holocaust during the Cold War, and people got on and they coped and they did things. People cannot be hidden what is happening on climate change. It's impossible. It'll be impossible in a few years. Right? The changes are happening so quickly and so rapid. Wait till we lose Arctic sea ice, you know, maybe in the next three to five years, and then things are going to go completely haywire. Climate change emergency. This cannot be hidden from the public. So, you know, we, the sooner we, we, we address it, the sooner we, the public recognize it, the sooner we declare the emergency that is warranted, the, the quicker the actions that can be taken that must be done. So let's have a look. I'm going to look at the scientist annotations in context. Um, in great detail. But first of all, I'm going to look at the overall comment. So here's Michael Mann. Okay, he says it's an overly bleak picture. Sorry, Michael, you got to look out the window more. Um, there's not, it's not an overly bleak picture. It's what is actually happening. Many of the things in the article are actually happening. Okay, um, it exaggerates the near term threat of climate feedbacks involving frozen methane. I'm sorry, but a few years ago, scientists like Michael Mann, we're saying that methane couldn't come up from the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf, right? That there was, a, there was, that it was frozen and there was a cap and it would stay underneath. Sorry, um, we've seen Siberian craters forming with meth, from methane on land. We have pingos underneath the ocean floor, floor, bulges in the ocean from methane. We have pockmarks from methane. The Russians, Shakova paper, a very recent paper, looked at how quickly the permafrost was thawing. And they came up, what did they come up with? Numbers like uh, 14 centimeters per year for the last 31 years, things like that. If you don't think methane is a problem, you, you don't understand the literature in the last few years. So this is absolutely unconscionable that this is mentioned here, that there's no such thing, no notion, there's no science supporting um, the notion of a game-changing planet melting methane bomb. We just don't know for sure, okay? We've seen records of massive releases of methane in the past, and we're seeing the Arctic awakening in terms of methane releases. Okay, so, you know, these are possible scenarios. Even if the chances are very, the risks are very low, as, as man is claiming here, which they're not from recent observations, um, it takes, it's, the public needs to understand that this is a threat that could change the planet overnight. And of course, Wadhams, um, in a paper a few years ago, modeled the release of 50 gigatons over a year or over 10 years. And the, uh, the implications to the uh, world economies were seven, uh, 70 trillion, were, were trillions of dollars. What was it, 60 trillion? I don't remember. The numbers are too big anyway. Okay, this is a, this, you know, maybe there's some incorrect detail. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think, I mean, the satellite data, you know, one satellite showed that the globe was warming less since 1998 than others, and then that was corrected and stuff. You know, these are details in some of the science. They don't, you know, attacking this, what about talking about the major features that will affect humanity in the paper rather than one little specific point? Uh, which may be inaccurate, but it, it, it put it put here prominently in his comments about the whole paper. This is it is very misleading. Okay, it's uh, sure he's probably running scared about what's happening in climate change like everybody else. 
right? So he's trying to rationalize, saying, oh, everything's going to be okay. It's not so bad. Okay, so what? here's another thing here. Um, this is about the satellite data set. Um, the evidence of climate change is a serious problem is overwhelming on its own. Yes, there's no need to overstate the evidence. I agree completely, and I do not think this paper, this, this um, New York Magazine um, document is overstating the evidence. He does. This is just an opinion. The thing is, is, you know, when scientists give opinions about things, they generally stay within their narrow area, and, and, but, but uh, you know, people that need to look at the overall system and give opinions. So it's good that other people are giving opinions, but don't, um, you know, don't be overwhelmed, okay? He's got PhDs on lots of papers and stuff. You know, what's his, cons what's his understanding of the entire climate system of areas that he doesn't specifically study? Because most scientists are so specialized, what they say in other areas, you have to, you have to really think about what they're saying. Okay, they might not know necessarily more than a well-informed reader, um, you know, who can, anybody can Google and get information now. So it's not a narrative of doom and hopelessness. Okay, that's not, that's ridiculous. We're heading to a very dark and gloomy and doomy place. But there's things that we can do. There was no mention of hopelessness in, in this particular um, thing. Okay, so let's look at some of these other things. So here's another article. Um, what is clear is that ongoing warming would have severe consequences. The Earth becoming uninhabitable is pure hyperbola. Well, I'm sorry, but in the Middle East right now, um, I mean, for 2016, we were 1.44 degrees above pre-industrial, above 1750, parts of the Middle East. Uh, the Gulf, the Gulf uh, was uh, 33 degrees Celsius. Wet bulb temperatures on land for several days, 35 degrees Celsius. Can't be outside, uninhabitable if that continues, you know, to be outside. You can't work outside. So this is this was is happening in some places on the planet already. Um, this is you know the, the author has done extensive research, talks about threats. The narrative ramps up the threat to go beyond the level that's supported by science. I completely disagree with that. Science can say you know science is not capable of doing everything. Okay, science can't predict the future accurately. You know we can see what happening with trends we can make projections we can do models but there's you know science cannot say that we have huge threats in the near-term future or we don't have huge threats in the near-term future okay and I would argue that the trends are much worse and, and they're understated here okay um, unusual piece the dire consequences it doesn't focus on worst case scenarios they're all saying the same thing here you know, there's nothing scientific about what they're saying in this aspect. I'll go to the specific points and see what they're saying scientifically, but they're just giving their own opinion. And like I say, most mainstream scientists do not recognize how serious climate change is. So when this article came out, um, then this was created within a few days um, and is a knee-jerk reaction by scientists who don't want to believe that things are as bad as, as they really are. So. You know, they're just people, like I said. But, you know, these are all wishy-washy statements. Anybody can make these statements. You know, uh, it goes beyond the evidence, okay? I mean, it's all like an echo chamber here. Of They're all saying the same sort of thing. They're all, oh, this paper is too serious. And, you know, high-end scenario, high emissions. Um, many scientists would argue that we can't survive in a four-degree warmer world if we reach it fairly quickly. Okay, um, IPCC, you know, they give those numbers, but they never give the outcomes of what, what uh, can happen. So, um, again, high emissions, you know, it talks about the research, you know, uh, anyway, probabilities of the scenarios. Okay, well, these are all details. This is not a scientific peer-reviewed paper that came out. It's an article in New York Magazine to communicate how serious climate change is, a pub is to the public, and these scientists are treating it and trying to rip it apart as a peer-reviewed peer paper. And they're, they're not experts in this particular field of all of these aspects. So they're all this, like I say, this is just a knee-jerk reaction. It's a long paper, factually wrong. The, the premise of the paper is not factually wrong. Okay, I'm gonna have to continue this video, try to speed up 